Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy. So Dune Part 2 ends on a dark cliffhanger. Hall defeats all of his enemies and he unleashes a holy war on the universe. A war that will cause the deaths of billions. This makes Chani leave Paul, setting up the story for the next chapter. And yes, there will be a Dune Part 3. Denis Villeneuve confirmed that the movie is in the works and it will adapt the second book in Frank Herbert's epic series, Dune Messiah. A very complicated and trippy sequel that subverts Paul's story and explores the terrible consequences of the first book. You are not prepared for what is to come. But Chani leaving Paul in part two is a major departure from the book. So we're going to explore what's going to happen in the next movie, how the changes from the book will influence part three, like Chani's story, and what will they do with Aaliyah, and how different Dune Messiah is going to be with this new direction. But that's not all. We're also going to explain what's next for the Dune universe beyond the third movie, like the upcoming prequel show and other projects that could happen in the future. And guys, I just want to let you know we have this awesome Spice Crispy shirt for sale at our merch store, ScreenCrushMerch.com, where we design all the merge ourselves. I freaking love the detail in this shirt. Notice it says Arrakis instead of Kellogg's at the top, toasted spice, the sandworm coming out of the cereal. You can get yours at our merch store link, which is below. I am Paul Mwadim Atreides, Duke of Arrakis. Okay, first we need to explain when we're actually getting Dune Part 3. According to Denis Villeneuve, the script is nearly finished. However, it's unclear when exactly the movie's going to be coming out. But I want it now! <laughs> But part two is doing very well, and it is an incredible movie, so I'm sure we're not going to have to wait that long. Although, the director said he doesn't want to rush Dune Messiah. They want to get it right. And yes, please, take your time, Denis. Please take your time. Give us another epic movie to cap off this trilogy. Because adapting Dune Messiah is going to be a major challenge. The book subverts Paul's story, and it explores the consequences of the choices made by people who believe that they can shape the entire universe. And it is a very dense and complex story filled with political schemes, betrayals, and some very trippy ideas, such as clones and even shapeshifters. Hey, person, please don't spoil the book for me. Oh, no, don't worry. We're going to keep the spoilers to a minimum. So to explain how we get to part three, let's explain how the ending of part two sets up Dune Messiah. Part two ends with Paul starting the Holy War. So why did he do that? Well, Paul was conflicted about his visions, and he actively tried to prevent them. However, everything changed after Fade Ratha attacked Siege Tabor. Paul sees visions of Chani's death, and he understands that if he doesn't embrace his destiny, the Harkonnens will massacre all the Fremen. This puts Paul on the path of fulfilling the Fremen prophecy. These people have waited for centuries for the Lizan al -Gaib. It's their name for Messiah. And after Paul drinks the water of life, he fully awakens his Quichet's Hatterak powers. Now he sees many futures all at once, and the one path that will lead him to victory. And Dune Messiah, this calculation of the perfect future is called the Golden Path. A path that will save humanity, but it will come with a terrible price. The Holy War. The small price to pay for salvation. From the moment Paul's ability to foresee the future is fully awakened, he must follow a set path with no deviation. This is why Paul's entire personality changes. He weaponizes the Fremen's prophecy, controlling them through dangerous religious extremism. And at the end of the movie, Paul defeats all of his enemies and claims the title of Emperor. However, the other great houses reject his ascension, and this forces Paul to unleash the Fremen on the universe and wage the holy war that he saw in his visions. So while Paul can see the future clearly, he's also completely blinded by it. He is trapped in a paradox. He must follow the predetermined path from his visions no matter what. You said one out of 14 million we win, yeah? Tell me this is it. If I tell you what happens, it won't happen. And according to what he's seen, the Holy War is a far less terrible outcome than the other futures that could have happened. And this is what Dune Messiah explores, Paul's conflicts with the Golden Path. However, part two has two major departures from the book, which change everything going into the third movie. The first is Chani's choice in the end. The second is the role that Aaliyah plays in this film. But let's start with Chani first. In the book, Chani stays with Paul, and she doesn't really protest the Holy War. And while Paul marries Irulan, she's his wife only in name. Chani is Paul's unofficial wife. But in part two, Chani leaves Paul after what he's done to her people. So why did Chani lose Paul? Well, part two explores the complexity of the Fremen culture, something that ties into Dune Messiah. The Fremen from the south, like Stilgar, are fully devoted to the Lasan al Gaib prophecy. And we see that Stilgar and these other Fremen are kind of religious fanatics who are willing to do anything for Paul. 
In contrast, younger Fremen from the north, such as Chani, do not believe in the prophecy. In fact, it seems like they don't follow any religion, and instead, they fight for their freedom. Chani doesn't see Paul as a savior. She and the others respect him because of his actions. She even tells him that you will never lose me as long as you stay who you are. Meaning the man she fell in love with and not some mythical messiah. And this is why Chani cannot stand by Paul after what he does to her people. He doesn't free them, he turns them into a weapon in his war. It is the ultimate betrayal. On top of that, Paul takes Irulan as his wife right in front of Chani. Anakin, you're breaking my heart. And I mean, just look at the framing of this shot. Everyone in the room bows down before Paul, with him standing between Chani and Irulan. And now there is a visual chasm between Paul and Chani. Afterwards, Chani leaves, refusing to join his holy war, and this sets a conflict between these two lovers. And while this is a departure from the book, it's a really smart change going into the next movie. From the moment Paul embraces the prophecy, our perspective as the audience shifts from Paul to Chani. Seeing the perspective of an anti-hero is always fascinating. However, Frank Herbert intended Paul to represent a warning against charismatic leaders and hero worship, the dangers of powerful individuals who gain absolute power over the minds of their believers. Wasn't I chosen to save you? Is it not my God-given purpose? to protect the United States of America. And based on part two, Villeneuve clearly intends to see Herbert's vision through. The people closest to Paul, like Jessica and Gurney, fully support him. Jessica even incentivizes Paul to follow this dark golden path. And most of the Fremen now see Paul as their space Jesus. So it makes sense that the hero role will shift to Chani in the third film, since it is her people that Paul is going to be abusing. Now, we should mention that after Paul drinks the water of life, he tells Jessica that he saw that Chani will come to understand what he's doing. But it's unclear what that actually means. Did Paul see a future where Chani will forgive him, or was he talking about Chani joining the battle at the end of this movie? And the question is, what will she do about the Holy War? After all, we don't know if all the Fremen joined Paul or if it's only the people from the South. It is possible that the younger Fremen from the North, the ones who don't believe in the prophecy, will reject this holy war, and Chani could unite them to stop Paul and stop his holy war across the galaxy. Now, in the book, Chani has a very different story, and part two might have already teased that with Chani's blue scarf, but this is something we're going to talk about in our spoiler portion later in the video. But without spoiling any major plot details, in the second book, some Fremen become disillusioned with Paul. These Fremen believed that Paul's ways had caused the assimilation of their culture. Some of these Fremen even join a conspiracy to bring down Paul. This plot against Paul is a major plot point of Dune Messiah. In the movie, Chani could take the role of a leader among the Fremen who reject the prophecy. And then she might even lead them against Paul after seeing the horrors of the Holy War. Because in the book, the Holy War led to the deaths of 60 billion people. Er, that's a lot of people. This Paul guy is not a hero, he's a Darth Vader. Exactly. Paul's story parallels Anakin falling to the dark side. So in a way, Chani could be a mixture of Padme and Obi-Wan. Like if Padme had led the rebels against Vader and the Empire. And that's what we see happening in part three. Chani leading her people against Paul and the fanatic Fremen. But rather than trying to kill him, Chani will try to save him from himself. But Chani might represent something that Paul has lost, hope. She might be the key to stopping the madness and helping Paul find hope and a better path for the future. And this will create a conflict for Paul because Chani might pull him away from the path that he saw in his visions. And in fact, there might be forces in play by other factions that deliberately incite this conflict to bring down Paul, but more on that in a moment. The other departure from the books in part two is the role of Aaliyah, Paul's unborn sister. You see, in the first book, there is a two-year time jump after Paul and Jessica join the Fremen. In that time, Jessica gives birth to Aaliyah. However, Aaliyah is born fully conscious. She's like an adult in a child's body. Hooray, right, how did that happen? Because Jessica drank the water of life while carrying Aaliyah in her womb. Get out of my until you tell them both who I really am. Now in this movie, there's no time jump, so Jessica is still pregnant with Aaliyah at the end of the film. But Aaliyah communicates with her mother with telepathy from the womb, and she seems to be a really snarky baby. Paul sees an adult Aaliyah in his vision, played by Anya Taylor-Joy. Now the second book takes place 12 years after the events of the first, but it's unclear if there's going to be that much of a time jump in the next movie. I mean, Aaliyah is clearly older than 12 in this vision. This might indicate that there won't be a huge time jump after part two, and the third film will have two versions of Aaliyah. A creepy child Aaliyah and an adult Aaliyah who will appear in Paul's visions. This way, Aaliyah will be a constant reminder of Paul's future. So basically, a visual 
visual representation of his struggles with the path that he is on. In fact, Aaliyah could take the role that Jamis had in Paul's visions. He's the Fremen that Paul had to kill in part one. That duel put Paul on the path of joining the Fremen and eventually fulfilling the prophecy. Jamis has been appearing in Paul's visions even before his death. He was sort of like his guide like a first ghost, something like that. So now Paul sees the future clearly. Aaliyah will replace Jamis in his visions, and she will try to push him to follow the golden path whenever he doubts it. You are the golden path. The understanding right in front of you, but you must decide. In that case, there doesn't need to be a huge time jump in part three. And this way, we can see the Holy War actually happening. Because you see, by the start of Dune Messiah, the Holy War is mostly finished. And that was what Frank Herbert was going for. He wasn't so much interested in big space battles. He wanted to explore the consequences of Paul's decision. But for the movie, we need to see the horror of what Paul has unleashed on the universe. This will be important when Chani leads her own faction of Fremen to stop this war, where she can now lead the Fremen into a better fate than the one Paul has prepared for them. Now, earlier we have spoken about forces who will incite the Fremen against Paul, and this is a major plot point in the book. Multiple factions joined forces to create a conspiracy to overthrow and kill Paul. The Bene Gesserit and Princess Irulan were part of this alliance. But person, didn't the space riches want to create the one? So why are they mad about Paul? That is true. The Bene Gesserit planned to create the Quichut's Hatterach for centuries. However, they wanted to control the one. They cannot control Paul. So in the second book, the Bene Gesserit want to remove Paul from power. But they need Paul and Irulan to make a baby and then create a new Quichut's Hatterach that they can control. They're joined by the Spacing Guild, who held full control over space travel for a long time. And now, their monopoly is at risk. And the other faction is the biggest addition to the Dune universe. And they're the Tleilexu. So there are aliens in Dune now? No, they're not aliens. The Tleilexu or the Bene Tleilexu are genetically modified humans. But they are so far removed from humanity, they might actually be aliens. Some Tleilexu are genetically modified to be shapeshifters called face dancers. They're basically like the faceless men from Game of Thrones. Vala Morgules. Vala Morgules. Also, the Tleilexu can bring people back from the dead with clones. They even bring back somebody who died in part one to trick Paul. And we might have already gotten a tease to the Tleilexu in the movies. Remember that spider creature from the first film? Oh, I don't like that. It's too creepy. Yeah, so freaky. But it gets worse because the Reverend Mother uses the voice on the spider. Get out. It understands. It understands because it used to be human. So it was likely modified by the Tleilexu. Anyway, all the factions work against Paul and Dune Messiah, and the Tleilexu are a key to finding a way to negate Paul's ability to see the future. All of this sets up a really epic part three. Considering the ending of part two, I do believe the film will focus on the Fremen conflict and the horrible consequences of Paul's actions. Now, before we talk major spoilers for the future of Dune, there is another Dune project that is coming out this year, and it's the Dune Prophecy Show, which is set to air on Max later this year. Ooh, what's this show about, person? Well, Dune Prophecy is a prequel show that takes place 10,000 years before the events of part one, and it will follow two Harkonnen sisters as they fight the forces that threaten the future of humanity, and they establish the Bene Gesserit. The show is based on Sisterhood of Dune, a book that was written by Frank Herbert's son, Brian, and Kevin J. Anderson. This story takes place at a chaotic time when the Galactic Civil War was raging. This was the era that led to the formation of the Imperium and the Bene Gesserit. And it also was the beginning of the Spacing Guild, who monopolized space travel with the help of the Spice. So this is a really fascinating era in the Dune universe. The concept of the early Bene Gesserit dealing with a chaotic era for humanity parallels the uncertain times that follow Dune Part Two. Also, since Part Two is the end of the Carino Empire, it's fitting that the prequel will explore how it all began. Now, we should mention that the show had a very rocky production with multiple showrunners and directors leaving the project due to creative differences. And the entire production was overhauled after filming had already begun. Er, that's never a good sign. No, it's not. But fingers crossed that this prequel show will be what House of the Dragon is for Game of Thrones. The Dune universe is so fascinating, and there is a gold mine of storytelling for future movies and shows. Yes, and then we could also have the Dune MCU! Well, I don't think we have to do that, but this does lead us to the future of Dune. Denis Villeneuve said that he is interested in ending his trilogy with Dune Messiah. But there are four sequels to the second book, at least the ones written by Frank Herbert. Part three should be the end for Villeneuve's story, but we do think that Dune should continue with Children of Dune and God Emperor of Dune. Those books are about Paul's legacy, and we believe that they could be adapted into a TV show. And so this brings us to some major spoilers for the books, so you guys have been warned. <laughs> The sequels to Dune Messiah follow Paul and Shawnee's children, Leto II and Ganema. 
and Dune Part 2 might have given us a hint that Chani is pregnant. She wears a blue scarf on her head, but right before the final battle, she wraps it around her arm. Now, this scarf is very important because in Fremen culture, it means pregnancy and motherhood. In the first book, Paul and Shani have a child, Leto II, but he was killed by the Sardaukar. So, the blue scarf might be a hint to Chani being pregnant, but if she is, they will likely skip right into Ganema and Leto II. Wait, another Leto? Yep, different boys, same name. Oh, like Aegon. Yes, like Aegon. In the second book, after years of struggles, Chani gives birth to twins, Leto II and Ganema. Leto grows up to be even more powerful than Paul, and he's the one who fulfills his father's golden path, leading to thousands of years of humanity suffering all to eventually save it. So I have chosen to make a world where humankind can create its own future from moment to moment, and free a future predetermined. Also, Leto sort of becomes a human sandworm. Oh, me? Nah, I'm just a worm. <laughs> Oh. This story needs to be told, but I think that the long form of a TV show will be a better adaptation for Children of Dune and God Emperor of Dune. So that's what we think is next for Dune, but what do you guys think is going to happen in part three? And should there be more Dune after the third film? And what stories do you hope to see adapted? Big shout out to the writer and editor of this video, Mr. Pavel T. You can find his links below. Guys, let us know what you think down in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.